So I came across this very interesting article yesterday, which is about DNS and DNS is something which is scary. If it's something you have not worked with a very long time, you would most likely miss out on some part, one or another thing. And in the last few days, I did create one video where we discussed a little bit about DNS using GoDaddy's as an example. So in this video, let's try to take this discussion further and discuss about this blog post, which covers a little bit more into DNS and especially load balancing with DNS, which is a very interesting thing so before jumping into the blog post itself i just want to set a few things right in terms of like how load balancing and how these things usually work so what happens is let's say that you have a website right let's say you have a website called as formio.app right so you see over here if you have a website like formio.app if you are building something like us where we create a lot of platforms for other people right so what formion does as an example if i give you is acme.formion.app is one of the schools right which is on formion code eater is another school which is on formion itself so these schools for example are hosted on formion's infrastructure right so fundamentally what's happening over here that whenever i'm visiting this page whenever i'm refreshing this specific page let's say whenever i first this so every single call which is going is hitting our infrastructure right so what happens is that when you scale up service like this when you have formion let's say as an infrastructure and you want to scale this up that means that there will be many many people so let's say this is person one this is person two person three person four all of these people are now starting to request right so we are scaling up we are tying up with more schools more creators who want to create content and all of these are hitting the formions infrastructure right in terms of I need where all of them need a specific resource whether that's code eater whether that's acme whether that's something else whether that's algo prep so, so if we take a look here it could be code eater it could be algo prep it could be some dummy domain so it could be any of these websites like many many such websites so when you use something like this what you would realize is that if this is running on an ec2 instance let's say if this is an ec2 computer this is not enough because if the traffic spikes if the traffic increases a lot you would have some trouble in how do you serve so much traffic so the obvious thing over here is that you create multiple instances of your app right so instead of one let's say you have four such instances which can balance it now this in theory looks very nice and very good but how do you even route the traffic to these four right because at the end what you need is which you typically hear is something known as a load balancer so what happens with a load balancer is that this accepts all the request and then load balancer forwards it depending on the load of your infrastructure right it sees that which instance is free which is busy and then accordingly it will just direct the traffic to one of these four instances but the problem is that now you have a failure point or at load balancer if you create this on your own then you have a failure point at load balancer granted like it's not doing all the computation which these four computers will be doing which would be heavy in terms of you know making call with the database so if you have a database over here these servers are talking to database they are like making some external calls fetch calls all of that so load balancer doesn't have to do that sure but still it has to act as a single point of contact with these websites right and what happens in most cases is that this load balancer almost always is a good choice that it's managed right so either you go with cloud provider like aws or cloudflare or something like that that where you buy a load balancer from them and then you create your own applications and if you look at cloudflare for example these load balancers can get a little pricey real quick right so if i look at load balancer pricing so i'm not able to find load balancer pricing let me just show you that in our dashboard itself so let's take a look at this domain which i have and if i enable load balancing over here you can see that let's say if i have four endpoints right which we talked about in this architecture and you have like 60 seconds checks let's say so if let's say if your server goes down it could theoretically take up to 60 seconds to remove it from the traffic routing thing so if you want to go down to 15 seconds you can choose that for better performance and if you want to check it from eight regions which is again like a better option and if you you know enable or dis keep disabling this traffic steer so you can see like you're already at 45 us dollars a month in terms of bills and of course it increases as you increase the number of endpoint servers right so i mean it's not something which is like you know 
like other services in a way. Plus, the first 500,000 queries shared across all load balancer in your account are free. Beyond that, it's charged at 50 cents per 500,000 queries. That means $1 per million queries, right? So it's not cheap, right? If you have a website which receives a lot of traffic and it's like a free blog or something where bots and everything is crawling up also, this becomes slightly expensive. However, the interesting part is, is that there is a simple trick to load balancing, which is not exactly like it doesn't come with all the pros of a load balancer itself, but you can still make it work. And that is what this blog post is about. That is, instead of using load balancer for load balancing, you use DNS, right? So you put a huge layer and you use DNS for load balancing. And DNS, by definition, is a extremely, extremely scalable infrastructure, right? Take a look at this tweet by Matthew, who's the CEO of Cloudflare, who mentions that they are serving more than a trillion DNS requests per day. And if you do a little bit of math, you will figure out that's about 15 million requests in a second. So your DNS layer, which is like handled by Cloudflare, let's say, is able to handle 15 million requests in a single second, which is insane, insane amount of engineering and insane amount of load balancing, if you can say that, goes into creating a system like DNS, right? So what you can do is use DNS as a load balancer and let's try to figure out what that is. So what is round robin DNS? Normally when you're serving a website from VPS like DigitalOcean or Hertzner, you add a single A record in your DNS provider, right? This means that whatever domain you write will serve data from this specific domain, this specific IP. In round robin DNS, you specify multiple servers for same subdomain like this. So just to elaborate on this a little bit, first of all, what exactly is round robin? Not in DNS, but in general, what round robin is. So round robin is basically, let's say if you have three, four, five, six items over here. Round Robin basically says that, hey, whenever the next request comes in, like in general, not even requests, like whenever the next event happens, you just pick up the next thing, right? So if you are at three, the next time something happens, pick up four. If you are at four, pick up five and so on, right? So what he's trying to say is that over DNS, you can implement something like this by adding multiple records, right? So what happens again with DNS is that you can specify that you can add an A record for, let's say we added A record code eater dot pro to our IP address 1111 let's say for example which is let's say that this is an IP address owned by Fermion right so whenever I'm opening this domain codeeater.pro which is hosted on Fermion what DNS does is that it says that okay this domain belongs to this IP address and now your computer then connects with the computer over there right so this DNS basically let's say if this IP address is 1111 if IP address of this computer is 2 if IP address of this computer is 3 and this one is 4 what I can effectively say is that I can add four records as A records over here, right? So now the blog post says that effectively you can do something like this and whenever based on like whatever IP your computer picks up, it would connect to that particular instance, right? Now with DNS, the thing is that there is no load balancer as such, right? It's sort of like a, in a way, you know, you're just saying that, okay, these are like four or five IP addresses and you're hoping that over a large scheme of users, the users would get equally or evenly distributed, right? Over a large number of users. So it sort of acts as a load balancer in itself. It's not actively doing load balancing for you. So it's not able to like check your CPU usage or anything and then actively read out the traffic. But it's like a poor man's load balancer where you don't want an actual maintained infrastructure layer in front of your architecture. So this allows you to share load between multiple servers as well as automatically detect which servers are offline and choose the online ones. So I mean, this exactly is not right because I mean, this depends on the client, not on the DNS. DNS in itself does not has this capability where it can detect offline servers and not return you that IP address. So this statement is slightly wrong or slightly, you know, missing a little bit of context. But uh, yeah, we'll figure this out. So let's take a look at how does this work in theory, right? So in theory, there's an RFC 8305 called Happy Eyeballs about how the clients should sort addresses before connecting, right? But this definitely, this now this is definitely above my experience level, but this section seems like the closest to answering my question. If the client is stateful and has a history of expected round trip times for the routes to access each address, it should add a destination address section rule between eight and nine that prefers addresses with lower round trip times. Okay, so the inference from this block of text he's deriving is that it's basically checking if the servers are online or offline and sort the online ones according to ping times. And because your browser indeed is stateful, it's running on your computer itself and it's not like a sort of serverless or something, this clause should apply. So in practice, what he did is that he created three VPS, which is like a EC2 machine, one in in US, one in Europe, and one in Singapore. I made three proxied and three non-proxied A records in Cloudflare. So if you don't know what a proxy record in Cloudflare is, think of it as 
a way where Cloudflare acts as a middleman. So if you have a server over here and let's say you are managing its DNS with Cloudflare, then you have two options. The first option is you keep orange light on, right? When you keep this orange light on, which is this one, what you are effectively doing is you are proxying your traffic through Cloudflare's infrastructure, including the DNS requests. So what this means is that this IP address, if I request rr-cf on his domain, it would not give me back this IP address, right? It would give me back an IP address which belongs to Cloudflare. And then Cloudflare would internally proxy that request back to my origin server, right? So Cloudflare would sit in between and then it will proxy it back. If you keep orange light off, which in this case is the case, what Cloudflare would do is that directly give me this IP address. So the client, which in this case is the browser, will directly connect to the computer. So there is no proxying involved by Cloudflare in this. So he created these three servers and they then every single server is running this Nginx. I'm not sure if this domain is operational, but we can check it out. Yep, looks like it is operational. So you can see like a one pixel image. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a one pixel blue image, which is over here. And it's also in the favicon. So you can check that, right? So this domain is supposed to serve a color.png, which is a one pixel red, green, and blue PNG file. So I made an HTML test page, which fills a 10 cross 10 grid with random images. Okay, so we already have a page over here. Okay, so you can see that this grid, when I refresh this, you can see that it's filling some of these images uh, as I am loading this page, right? So the server colors are as follows. US is green, Europe is blue, and Singapore is red. I'm testing from Europe. The Europe server is much closer to me than US, especially the Singapore one, so I should be seeing blue boxes. So Chrome, I'm also on Chrome. He says Chrome selects somewhat randomly between all locations, but once selected, it sticks with it. It reevaluates the selection after a few hours. In this case, it stuck with Singapore for hours, even though by far it is the slowest server for me. And you can also see that in case of direct, I'm getting a green. That means I'm getting US. And if I do a hard refresh over here, I'm not sure if it'll impact. Not really. So I'm getting like greens always. So like he said, Chrome is picking up a random selection and it's sticking to it. Also an interesting behavior on Chrome was when not using HTTP2, it can sometimes choose randomly between two servers creating a pattern like this. Here it is choosing between Europe and US randomly. So it, it is able to change the IP address which it is using mid request, which is interesting because I would have assumed that idly Chrome or any sort of client would sort of cache the domain with the IP it is supposed to use for at least some time, but Chrome shows this behavior. Firefox also behaves similarly to Chrome, selects a location randomly on startup and then sticks with it. If I restart the browser, it picks up a different random location. So because Firefox and Chrome are same, I'll just avoid opening it in Firefox. In Safari, however, Safari always selects the closest server correctly. Even if it goes offline for a while, after a few refreshes, it always finds the Europe server again. Okay, so if I open it in Safari, you can see I'm getting blue and blue is Europe which I am also assuming is the closest location. I'm not exactly sure which location would be closest to me, but I would assume that Europe 100% is closer to the US server. Curl also works correctly. First time it might not, but when you run the command twice, it always corrects to the, connects to the nearest server. If you have multiple VPS around the world, try this command and check which one gets selected. With Cloudflare, picks a random location based on your client IP and then sticks with it. So you can see with Cloudflare, I'm always getting blue, right? In Chrome itself, in Chrome also I'm getting blue, in Safari also I'm getting blue. Now if I go to my mobile hotspot, it always connects to the Euro server. If I log in into some VPS and run the same girl command, I can be see this behavior across the world. Interesting. So what happens when one of the servers is offline? Say I stop the US server. So the server is stopped. Chrome, while loading directly, it is able to select a different server. Cloudflare, on the other hand, you can see like, you know, it's giving up. Cloudflare is not able to do the exact load balancing as expected. As you can see, all clients connect correctly, detect and choose an alternative server. Actually, they do this fallback so well that if I turn off the server while they are loading, they are correct within less than a second. Here's an animation of a 50 cross 50 version of the same grid on Safari. So you can see in the middle of the loading of the, you know, this image, he would have probably disconnected the server by stopping Nginx on that server. And it automatically Chrome, the Safari at least, switches to the second set of servers, the second set of A records, right? So these IP addresses go down, Safari switches to maybe like a couple of others, depending on like it switches to the one which is next in the priority. And what about Cloudflare? As you can see, in the screenshots above, Cloudflare does not detect an offline server. It keeps on accessing the server. It decided for your IP, regardless of whether it's online or offline. If the server is offline, you are served offline. So which is interesting because we would expect Cloudflare to also act sort of like a smart client, right? Where just like in your browser, it's able to detect that 
a server is down and it switches to the next IP. Because Cloudflare sits in the middle and with orange light on, this effectively is communicating with your users. So this is like Cloudflare and Cloudflare returns a set of IP addresses to your users, right? So these IP addresses, they are Cloudflare's addresses. So these addresses are never down. However, Cloudflare actually would perform a request to your server, right? Whenever a request comes in from a user. So what's happening over here is that user says that I need, you know, ABC dot form your dot app let's say as a domain right cloudflare says okay here's the ip address 104 point something something dot something dot something right so it says cloudflare says that this is my ip address user says okay and then user sends another request saying to this ip address i need content of abc dot form your dot app now over here cloudflare's infrastructure kicks in it sees the host name and it figures out the customer with which this host name is associated and it sends the request upstream based on the dns which we have provided based on the a records which we have provided right so this is where the problem is happening where cloudflare is not able to switch according to him cloudflare is not able to switch once a server in one of these a records is down so if you add all of these a records and they are proxied by cloudflare it's not able to understand that this particular ip address is down which i mean if browser is able to do i would expect you know sort of like cloudflare should also be able to do it because of their huge infrastructure and huge point of presence across the world plus one of the references in their documentation which he lists down is zero downtime failover so it says that if you have another a or triple a four a records which is ipv6 in your cloudflare dns or cloudflare load balancer provides another endpoint zero downtime failover will automatically retrace request to your origin even before load balancing decision is made zero downtime failover will trigger a single retry only if there is another healthy endpoint in the pool and a 521 522 523 or all of these status codes are occurring no other error codes will trigger a zero downtime failover so it sounds like a bug like he says it's a bug in their network Work. sounds like a bug because they have already mentioned if your server is returning a 500 error code i don't exactly remember what error code it would return if there is no response so there might be a nuance here because they have explicitly mentioned the status codes but i'm assuming that this one of these status codes should cover that cloudflare is not able to connect so there is also a hacker news discussion about this where the both the CEO and CTO of Cloudflare replied, which is very interesting. So the first hint which Cloudflare's CTO gave is that I'll have to check with the DNS team, but most likely it's something with affinity between the client IP and the backend server. And the question is, do you break that affinity if the backend server goes down? Then he clarifies that this has nothing to do with session affinity. Apparently there is a difference between our paid and the free plans, getting the details and finding out why there's a difference and we'll post. And then somebody replied that Matthew who is the CEO mentioned that there is no difference right and that is probably mentioned over here I might be wrong but I think this is the comment which he's mentioning where Matthew says that all plans on Cloudflare use any cast which will prefer the shortest network route free plans get lower priority than paid plans so may not be nearest location but it's definitely not random after this Matthew himself replies where he says that Cloudflare's it's complicated here what's somewhat complicated here is it's apples and oranges Cloudflare offers DNS and proxy service the op is using both comparisons are merely dns services i wasn't clear on x whether op was getting confused that the ip we return via dns doesn't change or if they were concerned that behind the proxy we are not routing correctly i think after reading this the answer is the latter which is true right so the ip is correct which is the cloudflare ip address so cloudflare always returns the correct ip to the user but the problem is that cloudflare itself is not routing it correctly confident we always will route optimally as it's in our interest and our customers but why we are not failing over on failure is interesting that looks like as john said a difference between free and paid plans that is if it makes at sense at some point doesn't obviously today we'll figure out what's up and get fixed asap so what's happening over here is that this difference probably like they mentioned i mean only cloudflare would know it but that difference exists because of some free and paid plan so on paid plan maybe cloudflare has this check where it's checking if multiple a records are pointing to some of the a records and those multiple records are pointing to services which are down and it's not failing over to the other a records and then somebody said please remember to include a ttl so i know how long i can cash that answer which is like a dns joke and that itself was a joke because he said that i'll get an authoritative answer so yeah so there's no further update on this maybe they'll reply today maybe they'll reply in some time but this was a really interesting blog post right a lot of things to learn a lot of things to understand and in general about cloudflare also you figured out that there this is a paid feature apparently which like matthew also 
says that they also forgot why this is paid but this is interesting right so let's see what happens so that's all for this one hopefully you learn something new i will leave all the links in the description so do check out the blog post and the tweets and everything if you like the video make sure you like and subscribe thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next video really soon Thank you.